So first off, I want to ask a question of everybody, which will be, how many people have heard this sound before? So, can you guys believe that in the mid-90s, we used to wait that long just to get connected to the internet? I mean, that's kind of amazing, right? When you really think about it now, your phone is like always on, and everything is just, it's, it's instant gratification, right? So, Ticketmaster kind of had the same problem many, many moons ago, where, you know, it took us a long time to deliver software. Um, so, this is the story of how Ticketmaster kind of went from six weeks to six minutes. Almost, because we're not quite there yet. We still have a ways to go, but that's our goal. Um, my name is Shaquille Sarathia, and as you heard from Gene, I do go by Shaq. A uh, couple of questions that I always get about my name. No, I was not named after Shaquille O'Neal. I was actually named after a poet that my mother loved. Um, and yes, I know that I look taller, darker, richer on TV, but... <laughs> So, the only thing that Shaq and I share in common is the fact that we both can't hit free throws. So, anyways. All right, moving on. So, a little bit about Ticketmaster. Um, so, you may have heard of us. We sell a few tickets. We're now a part of Live Nation Entertainment, which is a, uh, a global entertainment company. They do, um, uh, we have artist management, we promote events, all of those things. Um, Two questions that I always get about Ticketmaster when I tell people that. The first question is, can you get me free tickets or can you get tickets for XYZ event? A um, little bit about Ticketmaster is that we're basically like a middleman. So if you think about eBay, right, they don't actually own the inventory, so neither does Ticketmaster. We actually don't own the inventory. It's all the inventory of our clients, the promoters, the artists, things like that. So, no, we, I can't get you free tickets to the sold out event for One Direction, whatever it might be. Um, but once in a while, because we're part of Live Nation, we do have a lot of our own venues, and so you know, we kind of get tickets for that. But yeah, more, we can't get tickets. And the second question that I always get um, is, what's up with those bleeping convenience fees? So, little secret about the convenience fees. So, First off, what I tell everybody is that, let me, let me tell you guys the secret of how to avoid paying convenience fees. Very simple. All you have to do is wake up early, drive yourself to the venue, uh, the box office, wait in line, and buy those tickets, if you get lucky. So that's how you can avoid those convenience fees. Um, obviously, it's quite convenient then, right, to get it from your phone or your, or your uh, desktop. But the other thing about the convenience fees, which is kind of like the dirty little industry secret, when a promoter you know, goes to an artist and says, hey, you rock, you're awesome, let's do a show together, we'll get my people to talk to your people, and we'll do lunch, right? So what happens is, is that the promoter gets or not the promoter, sorry, the artist, of course, is on a high. This promoter, he wants to do it, he's talking about sellout shows, and so the artist starts seeing money in their eyes, right? So the artist will come up and say, give me 105% of the face value of the ticket, and I'll do the show. So you think about it. The ticket is, say, 100 bucks. The artist wants $105. Where's that money coming from? The convenience fees. So, so some of that money goes to them. Now realize, Hmm. Nobody else has gotten paid yet. We haven't gotten paid. You know, the promoter hasn't gotten paid. The venue hasn't gotten paid. There's a lot of people with their hands in the pot for this. So at the end of the day, when you're paying 20 bucks for a convenience fee and you're like, oh, those damn Ticketmaster people, we, we're getting two bucks. That's it. That's, that's the amount of money that we get. So it's not a lot, and that's kind of the, the backstory on the convenience fees. Um, a little bit about kind of on the technology side, our scale. As I mentioned, we are a global uh, company. We do have seven data centers worldwide. We have about 20,000 OS images, so that's VMs and bare metal. Not everything is a VM for us, at least not yet. Um, and uh, we do transactions in excess of about $16 billion annually. Uh, again, that's globally. And when we have these on sales, and, and I'm sure at least some of you guys know what an on sale is, is Friday morning, 10 a.m., 
you know, something goes on sale. Uh, last Friday was Garth Brooks. I don't know how many you know, country music fans, but um, Garth Brooks goes on sale. That's called an on sale. And during those peaks, we do over a million dollars a minute at times. Um, that's where we actually make most of our revenue is those peaks. So, and, and that's actually a struggle for us in our, um, in our business because that defines a lot of what we do. If we mess up and during that one, one point, you know, Twitter is blowing up, um, people are complaining, and, and really the fans are upset because if there's something that people are passionate about, it's their, it's their music, it's their sports teams, it's their, their live event. I mean, it's something that is, that is non-replicatable. So, you know, it's, it's a big deal for us. The other thing is also we do have um, 255 million plus user accounts in our system. So, I mean, it's not like gigantic, it's not Facebook type scale here, but you know, it's not, it's not uh, trivial. So when we talk about compliance issues and, and regulatory problems, you know, th these are some of the things that we're facing because these are people that you know, we have their personal information on. So um, I want to talk a little about the story. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about kind of the challenges that we faced, some of the early technical solutions that we implemented, um, kind of what was going on behind the stage. Uh, talk a little bit about the solution, what, what we're kind of doing now, where we're kind of going, the direction that we're in, and then kind of the impact in terms of where, what, what we've seen so far. So let me talk a little bit about the early tactical solution. So Ticketmaster has been, you know, a um, little flashback to 2000, uh, a little history there, is um, Ticketmaster and what you guys probably know most, Ticketmaster.com, were not the same company actually. So Ticketmaster was very traditional in that we sold tickets through box offices, through outlets, you know, tower records, things like that. Um, and when, when this person came around and said, ooh, I think you guys should sell on the internet, you know, basically Ticketmaster was kind of like, yeah, 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 just, just be an outlet, go over there by yourself. So I actually worked for a company called City Search at the time, and City Search was, it, we were called Ticketmaster Online City Search, and we were a separate company from Ticketmaster. So back in 2001, um, we were owned by Barry Diller, USA Networks. We bought out Ticketmaster because the belief from Barry Diller was is that the internet is going to it's going to take over all of this retail. You look at Amazon at the time, you look at all these different companies, and the thought was is that the internet's going to rule. So why do we not want to own that part of the business? And move more sales over to the internet. So back in 2001, we purchased the company and we started doing a little re-platforming. Well, the first thing that we realized was, so at the time, internet sales were 3% of our overall ticket sales. Um, so the, the, the first 2001 plan, what we called was I-5. That was our company-wide initiative. And it stood for internet 5%, meaning 5% of sales should be on the internet. I mean, we're talking 2001. 5% of the sales. But to go from 3 to 5%, you know, that's, a, that's a pretty aggressive um, uh, uh, increase. So we, first thing that we did, because I came from a systems uh, administration background, um, my other colleagues did too, was we said, we, we can't build out these many systems. We can't build out these many servers. So, you know, systems administrators, send mail. We said, wow, this macro language. Let's start building our servers with M4. It's the coolest thing in the world. We're going to create these templates, and we're going to kickstart these boxes, and it's going to be awesome. So, so in 2001, we, we first started um, configuring systems with uh, M4. In 2003, as we started replatforming the product, we started onboarding a lot of developers. And you know, the first thing we saw were that developers were building their um, code on their systems. And that was proving to be problematic because we had a different uh, configuration in production. So we said we started giving them systems to be able to develop their code on. Again, we're hiring developers at a faster rate than we can buy systems. So we implemented virtualization, and we started you know, kind of automating these builds. So we had those like build mini cluster, and it would just essentially build out um, a group of servers for a developer to, um, to be able to develop on you know, a, a systems or an operations managed um, infrastructure. In 2004, we realized that M4 wasn't really all that great and that we needed a new tool. So we kind of looked around and 
at the time, you know, Chef and Puppet, they weren't, they weren't really around. I think the only thing that was around was CF Engine. And it really didn't meet the needs of what we were looking for. We wanted something object-oriented, hierarchical, things like that. So we ended up writing our own uh, CMS. At the time, we called it Rubik's, but when we open sourced it, Rubik's was already trademarked, so we call it Spine now. Um, so that was 2004. So the end result of that, through 2001, and what I'm going to show you in 2005 was that all through these years, we started increasing our uh, internet sales. So we went from what was 3% in early 2001 to 70 to 80% in 2005. In 2005, our biggest success was, I don't know how many Yankees fans are in the room or anything like that, but, um, or baseball fans, okay, there's a few, I guess. Um, so <laughs> you, will, you will know that Yankees fans are obsessive about their, about their uh, team. And what happened was is that, I don't remember if the Yankees were doing well or not, I'm not a baseball guy, but um, we had a pre-sale and it basically brought down the entire, um, our entire infrastructure. It was crazy. We had thousands and thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people connecting at the exact same time. Um, and a challenge for Ticketmaster is, is that we don't have nice bell curves of traffic. If you look at our traffic, it more, looks more like an EKG, right? We love 95th percentile. It's the best, it's the best billing model in the world for us. Um, but well, we, had a, we had a major problem because we saw the presale, brought down the infrastructure. And a baseball game, you know, what's 80 home games, Yankee Stadium, at least 50,000 tickets a game. So, I mean, you're talking a lot of tickets that go on sale all at once. And um, you got a lot of people in New York that really want these tickets. So we had this problem where we had to scale out, and the on sale was going to be two days later. Um, so we thankfully had just purchased like a hundred, few hundred servers or something like that. We didn't have them yet racked or built out. Um, we had to scale out the entire infrastructure by 150% within 48 hours. So from an infrastructure perspective, I mean, that was. That was fantastic. It was something that we hadn't had to do before. Um, so that was a pretty good success for us. It took us about eight hours to sell out that event uh, or those events, but um, it, it was a pretty good success. I think the company really appreciated what we had done. Then comes 2008. So 2005, 2008, not much going on, just kind of building, kind of doing things. 2008. Um, we had formed a new company called IAC Interactive. Uh, and then he sp uh, Barry Diller spun us out and kind of saddled us with about $750 million in debt. Um, also, if many people go back to the 401ks in 2008, you'll notice you took a big hit because of the economy. Well, if you think about it, disposable income is the, one, the first thing people are going to stop spending, right? And live entertainment is as passionate as it is, it's still disposable income. So we, took a, we, we were taking a pretty big hit at the time. Um, so the economy kind of forced us down a cost-driven mindset, right? Um, this was when we first did our uh, internal cloud. And it really got approved because of the ROI that was associated with the internal cloud. We were, you know, we were scaled out pretty large. Um, we had lots and lots of uh, bare metal servers. And Again, as I mentioned, our traffic patterns, you know, they, they don't go up like this. They're very spiky. So we need a lot of, we need a lot of uh, infrastructure to support that spike, but then afterwards, it's kind of, kind of useless. So if you think about a lot of the reporting functionality, CRM type things, those types of activities, well, they can live right next to the servers that are selling tickets. So the cloud ROI for the company was extremely, um, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was a great idea for them. They loved it. So we were able to get, that was basically the only project that literally got approved for 2008 through 2010. I and mean, there was nothing else going on uh, during that time because the, the money just wasn't there. It was basically drying up. Um, then in 2010, we merged with Live Nation. Um, we call it a merger of equals. But it was 51% Live Nation, 49% uh, Ticketmaster, and Live Nation took all the, the kind of the top spots. And at that time, actually another story here, which was in 2009, as we talked about 2008, the economy was going, uh, you know, it was getting tough. So in 2009, um, 
we had an on sale for Bruce Springsteen. And uh, the Bruce Springsteen on sale, we tried to get into the resale market, right? Everybody had heard of StubHub and huge market. And, and how are we going to refill our coffers with with cash, and that was one place that we hadn't been. I mean, most people in this room probably know of Ticketmaster. Most people have probably purchased something through Ticketmaster. It's not like there's much space left in the North America. It's not like there's much market space left in, in uh, North America for us. So, so we looked at uh, doing resale. Well, the unfortunate side effect of that was is that the way that we implemented it, it wasn't very obvious to fans, and they had a lawsuit against us. So. We, we had a million dollar um, outlay of cash that we had to give back to consumers. So this kind of forced a decision on what does the business want to do with Ticketmaster? Do we, does the business want to just say, hey, look, let's, um, let's just close it down and we're going to, you know, ride the wave, ride it off into the sunset, or are we going to go for broke and um, try to grow the business? Um, so we went to the, bit, we went to the board. And we kind of built the burning platform and said, oh my god, the sky is falling. And if you guys don't do anything, you're going to lose all the money here, and you're not going to get your next yacht. And so they gave us a whole bunch of money. So that kind of started the re-architecture of the platform. And that's where we really started to say, OK, look, we, are, we just built this kind of burning platform. We are, we're either sinking or we're going you know, to swim. So we need to change everything up. For, you know, we've done some things in the past, but let's build upon some of those things. And so what we did was that we started to really look at what a DevOps strategy might look like for us. Again, our problem was um, one of the reasons, one of the ways that we sold the platform or the, the re-architecture of the platform was the fact that we couldn't build, um, we could not build features fast enough. That was a huge issue for us. As a Ticketmaster, again, as we are driven by fans and clients. And so if, if clients don't like selling through us, fans aren't going to come to buy through us, right? So we have this incredible desire to, to please our clients, to please our customers. And if we can't get features out the door fast enough, and especially as, you know, um, as cloud and Amazon is starting to pick up, scale is not holding people back. That was, that was definitely a, a factor for people in the past, but it's no longer that. So we had to really come up with a way for how do we deliver software faster and faster and faster. And so 2010 was we started this process, and we started to say, OK, what are we going to do now? So now, as we started thinking through what are we going to do? We had a lot of things, right? As many of you people know, in an enterprise, it's different than a startup. In a startup, you've got nothing. You can start from scratch. It's great. In an enterprise, you've got customers. And for us, we had clients and fans. We already have a lot of employees around, the, around you know, all the world, actually. So what, are, what about them? How are we going to do that? And then, and then of course, the, the big thing is, is that we're a business, so we have to make money. So it's, if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense, right? So we had to kind of answer these things. And there were a ton of questions that we had to ask ourselves, right? For the fan experience, will we be able to provide an equal or better product? If we can't, why are we doing it? Because that's what we're trying to tell the, the board. That's why we need the money here. Will this actually result in faster time to market for our requested features? Again, this is part of that um, burning platforms. And then the, the, the final question was, will our fans have to deal with problems while we figure things out? We already have a business. We don't want to alienate all of our fans who are purchasing tickets. And when you're making this, you know, this drastic change to your organization, there might be problems, and if these problems are big enough, you know, how, how, you know, how long will somebody wait while you figure things out? The next thing that we had to deal with was with employees. Um, huge challenge, right? So you've got a 40-year-old company at this point almost, so you've, we've had, I think in our last um, monthly uh, presentation by our president, we had one person who just celebrated that 35th anniversary with the company. I mean, that's huge, 35 years in a 40-year company. Crazy. So how will the people adapt, right? I mean, um, we're changing everything up. How, how, are they going, how are we going to get them to adapt? We don't want to just fire everybody and start from scratch. We can't do that. Um, what type of training will we need? Again, we've got people that have been doing the same thing for 35 years. We're, you know, how are we going to invest in these people to, to train them up into the new way? Um, how do we overcome fear 
in the minds of our people. The moment you start talking about, especially for, an op for, for the operations side, the moment you start talking about support at the edge, developers will push to production, they'll be on call, they'll be dealing with this, you start to get people wondering, well, if they're going to do all that, what am I going to do? Right? And that's, that's, that's a challenge. You've got you to you work with people and make people understand. You know, and then how do we share this vision for the future? You've got you to gotta share what will happen here. What, what is it going to look like? How, um, what could it look like in the future? And, and start teaching people or training people to, to the new way of doing things and to explain to people that you know, people are more valuable than just pushing a button, right? I mean, at, at the end of the day, that's really what it's about when we talk about, um, you know, uh, the fear in, in people. They're, they're worried they're going to lose their jobs. So then the final thing was the dollars and cents of it all, right? So, of course, the business is asking, well, what's this going to cost if we're going to do this thing, right? Um, how about the learning pains? W what's that going to be? Um, and then we're doing this. Is our sales actually going to be any better? Because if they're not, then why the hell are we investing this time and money? Um, and the final thing was, how will we know this is working? Right? So, I mean, these are obviously questions from a business perspective. They need to understand if we want to invest in these things, how will we track it and, and how will we know? So, what we kind of came with is where we were. This, this is this can be a kind of a slide of where we started from when we went down this journey with these questions, right? So Ticketmaster, we have 17 different ticketing systems. Most of everybody in this room probably knows Ticketmaster.com. It is one of the biggest brands. However, um, so 49ers, uh, right, right down here somewhere, um, they are a client of ours, but they are not on the Ticketmaster.com platform. They're on a separate platform. Um, uh, and that platform is designed for season ticketing, for sporting events, things like that. If you've ever been to Vegas and you've been to a show at an MGM casino, Ka, Michael Jackson won, something like that, that's on another ticketing system as well. We support shows like that too. So we've got 17 different ticketing systems. Ticketmaster has grown through M&A activity. We're good at the A side. We kind of suck at the M side, though. So we got these 17 ticketing systems. We have 30-year-old technology, right? So if you look at Ticketmaster.com, the core ticketing system is 30-plus years old. Just to give you an idea of how old it is, and I don't know how many people will know, uh, a PDP-11 is what it actually runs on, right? <laughs> So, yeah, so to be able to sell tickets like that on, on it's now emulated, <laughs> but it still runs on, you can't buy them anymore, <laughs> they're not making them, so that's how old the technology is, so how are we going to, to turn this around, and, and again, you can't just start from scratch. Um, we had a hard line between development and operations. It was basically develop the software, throw it over the wall, ops guys are trying to install it. And you know, that, all the mindset that goes along with it. No, developers can't have access to production. No, you can't do this, you can't do that, right? Very, very hard to break down those cycles. Um, and then our release cycles, I mean, we were bi-monthly to quarterly. We were doing five to six releases a month on a good month. And that's if we had emergency releases because of the bugs that that had to come out, right? I mean, it's crazy. So that's where we were. So what did we do? So we, one thing I should mention is, is that I'm sure most people have heard of Conway's Law, right? So people who design systems will build the systems based on the communication paths within the company, right? So firm believer in that, and firm believer in that you have to break down the organizational structures to change the communication paths if you really want to change the underlying. So some of the things that we did was we developed, um, th this, is the, this is kind of a picture of the overall organization with, with the, the, side on, uh, the top side being the operational side. So what we did was, first thing we did was that we developed a tier one talk. You know, there's still issues, there's still legacy stuff. We needed, we needed a front line to be able to you know, prevent lots of problems from getting too far back. We also developed an SRE group, which can really help actually maintain the software and do things. So we're in the process of developing this right now, and they're actually watching. They're doing capacity. They're, they're watching configuration changes, things like that. Um, we took the systems engineering teams, and we aligned them to the delivery teams, to all the scrum teams. So that way, we could bring some of the operational um, knowledge down into the delivery teams and help the delivery teams with operational problems. 
And finally, what we did was that we empowered developers to push code to production. So at this point, many of our new, um, uh, a part of the replatforming, the new services that we're building, they are all being pushed to production by developers. So that was the solution. We started this about a year and a half ago, I would say, maybe two years ago. But really, it probably got started um, in earnest maybe about a year ago. So what did that, what has that achieved? So first off, 51% now of all of our services and products are deployed by development teams. That's huge from 0% a year and a half ago. So pretty big, um, pretty big uh, number there. Development teams now have an on-call. They don't all like it, but now they've got to be on call. So on Saturday or Friday mornings now, when we have on sales, we have a, uh, we have a like, tier one through four level of on sales. So when we have like, the top tier on sales, they are in the office at 7 a.m. because we're West Coast, and East Coast starts at 10 a.m. So um, they're in the office. They're, they're watching their systems. They're looking at their monitoring. They are part of the operational side of actually running the business. We, in September, and that number is actually low, was over 109 deployments in September. Compared that to about five to six, maybe a year and a half ago. So a huge difference. Um, some of the teams are actually, I should say, some of the teams are actually deploying, obviously, multiple times. Some, some teams are doing story level deployments. So every time a story is done, they deploy. Some teams are doing sprint level. Some teams are doing multiples per sprint. But you know that's the numbers. On the tier one side, We've had 490 alerts in September that were categorized as Tier 1 alerts that are resolved by the, the, the Tier 1 team. So if you just think about what that might mean for engineers, I mean, even if you look at 5 to 10 minutes for a context switch, you're talking you know, 1 to 2 man weeks of time every month. Not, you know, that's half an FTE, basically. So, the other side, this is the business side, and this is pretty impressive. Ticketmaster Resale. If you haven't heard of this or TM Plus, it's basically our new way to do resale in the market. Um, on one page, you can see primary tickets as well as secondary tickets. They're all safe. You know exactly what the tickets are. It's a huge change in our industry. And for the, in the six months, we launched it one year ago. And in the last six months, it has grown over 30%. And it's all been through iterative um, releases and, and things like that. It, it is a tremendous growth in our organization. And the real bottom line, was the increase in customer service rating. So we've been asking this question of people uh, for, I don't know, 10 years plus. Um, the question is, in general, how would you rate the stability of Ticketmaster products and services? So if you take 2012 as the baseline, and I mentioned to you that we started this around a year and a half ago, 2012 was the baseline, so that's zero. In 2013, the, the, the excellent rating increased by 5%. We just started, so not that great. And in 2014, I actually messed up these numbers. Gene was just talking about it. I actually thought that you know, uh, new dad was too tired, and he messed up the numbers, but I did. It's actually not 24%. It's an increase of 30% over 2013. It's a tremendous increase for um, our, actually our stability and, and what our clients and our fans are actually seeing. So amazing results for us. Um, things we don't know. Oh, well, things that we still got to do, sorry. Obviously, it's the continuous refinement, right? We, we, we're not down, we haven't made it down this journey yet. We still have to go, long ways to go. We're not at six minutes yet. We're only 109 deployments. We're looking for at least an order of magnitude higher than that. Um, we're trying to push more services to the edge, right? So customer service tools, get, get it out of our hands, get them over to customer service, let them deal with that stuff. Um, they're closer to our end users. They can deal, they, they know what our end users want. They can fix it fast. Client service tools for event building, that's a huge thing. If you've heard of Eventbrite, they allow anybody to build uh, an event. That's obviously a big competitor for us. So that's one of the other tools that we're trying to push off to the edge. Um, Training on people. Again, employees are, are you know, a huge asset to the company. And if we don't train them and if we don't teach them these new methodologies, then it'll be a problem for us. So things like Lean PMO, Agile you know, for Scrum, Kanban, we have kind of all of that going at the same time. Things we don't know. So there's a lot of things, and I, I just summed it up into four things really quickly. Right? When we talk about the alignment from the operations to the development, we don't know how many people we should be aligning. Have zero clue. What should those ratios be? Don't know. Um, 
When we talk about some of the responsibilities, we have 17, tic 17 different ticketing systems. We're spread throughout the world. I mean, we've got ticketing in North America, Europe, Asia, um, Australia. So what are the different roles for people? Um, if you notice, I never touched up on security. How does InfoSec fit into this? We want to move fast, and I don't know if I'll offend some security personnel in here, but you know, security people can be a bit paranoid. So how do we kind of leverage, <laughs> how do we leverage that? Um, and then the final thing is, again, goes back to the metrics. What other things do we need to be looking at? You know, we've got some metrics, and we've, you know, but, but what are the metrics that are really going to help us know, are we doing things right, are we making a mistake, and how do we course correct? So thank you for allowing me to take up your time and tell you a little bit about our story. So.